Hello, welcome to the ASP.NET Community Stand-Up. Today I'm joined by Julie Casper and Mar Marcel Feria. Uh, can you folks introduce yourselves? Of course. Hi, everyone, and happy Tuesday. Um, my name is Julia. I'm a program manager in the Microsoft Developer Division. I'm super excited to be here today um, and cover a little bit of the topic of Microsoft Power Platform and how we can boost your productivity. Hi, hello, everyone. I am Marcel Fejeda, and I'm a senior product manager in the Power Platform Developer Tools team, and we build tools for developers. Awesome. OK, well, I'm excited to see all the new stuff. Uh, as always, we'll start with the community links. I uh, got just a few of them for today. Uh, let me see. I'll switch over to this view here. And let me see. The links are shared in the description, and I'm sharing them here. And I'm also sharing them here. All right, so let's go. First of all, um, uh, this is the uh, last week, last Tuesday, uh, we released .NET 8 Preview 5. Uh, interesting stuff in here for, dot, or for ASP.NET developers. We've got, um, um, we have, let me see, the things that stood out to me, uh, there is some stuff for metric, source lang, some kind of general things. Uh, a nice thing I'm see I saw here is these uh, library analyzers. So analyzers can look at your code and see things that they would recommend. Hey, this is a possible issue. There are both errors and warnings. Um, so there's a lot of these that are just added in. Um, so those are based on Roslyn. They'll show up in any, in a, any IDE that supports that. Um, another neat thing that I saw in here was there's an Alpine ASP.NET Docker composite image. So there's tons of stuff going on with um, with the um, just Dockerization, all kinds of um, container management stuff in the latest releases. So this is really cool. Um, we also have a separate post on, uh, from the ASP.NET team on this release and some uh, a lot of great stuff here. Um, we're starting to see some of the new things for Blazor. So there's some big things going on with Blazor in this, uh, in this release in .NET 8. And so we're starting to see that here. There's a new uh, app project template. So that's a big thing. And then a lot of other just neat things. For instance, uh, SignalR, there's seamless reconnect. So it'll automatically just reconnect for you. There's AOT. And then also some updates for auth. Um, so this includes um, some, some things for the spa templates that make it uh, easier from an API to manage your identity stuff. Um, also, let me see, we got uh, in uh, Visual Studio in this release. So first of all, I like this that they're doing these kind of unboxing videos. These are neat. Um, there's some great stuff for web development here, some things that stood out to me here. Uh, well, first of all, there's a lot of stuff for, uh, for source control. So uh, things like creating a pull request, there's a branch, a multi-branch graph. There's a thing up here, I think, for comparison. So you can do file compare. This is something I've done so many times where I've installed a separate, you know, file comparison thing. And um, and uh, so this that is uh, nice to have that kind of built in. Um, let's see. The, that's some of the stuff. There's also, you know, just neat things like auto decom compilation, et cetera, so things. Um, okay, and community links, uh, this is neat. This is a post from Andrew Locke, and he's talking about validating uh, for nested I options. So the, the case here is he's got, you'll see there's a nested settings, and then that settings is included in the main settings. And the, the issue is validation does not automatically recurse and so it's not actually going to validate the nested settings. So this thing here, even though it says required, is not going to be validated. So the thing he shows off here, there's a, he did a previous post about, about this, and people have talked about different ways to do this, and including fluent validation. The thing he shows off here is using a neat package from Damien Edwards called mini validation. So mini validation, very simple to set up and configure. Um, has different options for how to do that. 
and then just kind of shows uh, as he goes through and tries it out. And, you know, you can see the validation errors for that. So uh, Damien has tons of great. I'm always stalking Damien's uh, GitHub. He's got some great little uh, libraries, some tag helpers, a lot of great stuff to keep up with. All right, just a few more. Uh, in .NET 7, we've got a few posts about uh, performance improvements there. So NOP Commerce is a really cool uh, open source uh, um, e-commerce thing for .NET. It's been around for a long time. It's really useful. And uh, it's neat to see as they're upgrading over time, they're going through the different versions and they post about the improvements that they see in performance. So uh, the big kind of scrolling down here, they've got a lot of great information. I, I recommend reading through the whole um, post. But uh, as you look here, there's um, this is pretty huge. So they're, they're showing from going from .NET 5 to .NET 7, just about half the response time. So uh, really significant improvements there. And then memory usage as well. So uh, really cutting down on the memory usage. I frequently do demos where I'll, I'll take an app and all I will do is go into the CS proj file and update the version. Don't do anything else. And then I'll, I'll you know, show some differences there. Show, um, the, the point here is that you can, you can see these huge performance, in many cases, you can see huge performance improvements with no code changes on your own just by updating the application. So, um, so this, anyways, this is cool to see going across load distribution, et cetera. We've got another post just went out this morning from the forms team. So this is Microsoft Forms and their backend, I didn't know this, their backend uses .NET microservices. So uh, these previously were in ASP uh, on .NET Framework and they migrated to .NET 6. They're actually um, running a lot on .NET 7 now. Uh, this post kind of deals with their .NET 6 findings. They talk about how they made the updates and, uh, and uh, you know, things they had to work through, how they did it. And then they looked at their findings here and they found up to 400% improvements in CPU efficiency. Um, and, uh, you know, just all across the board, P75 latency really improved. Um, and and now and uh, so they've seen, for instance, uh, a, a big thing here is a thirty percent plus uh, improvement in their cloud service computation costs. So very neat. All right, I've got just one more thing to call out here, and that is F Sharp Conf. This is a, the F Sharp community is putting on a virtual conference on June twenty sixth, coming up very very soon. So. Um, it's a great opportunity to learn from the community how they're using uh, F Sharp, all kinds of applied stuff. And that is it. I am done. So, um, all right, ready to turn over to you, Julia. Should I go ahead and share your screen? Awesome. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. I, I do love that you showed the Visual Studio blog post because actually our feature is all about Visual Studio and how we are trying to make the journey better there. So I love that you showed it. <laughs> oh, great. OK. Um, I know we talked about the Microsoft Power Platform last year. I think you invited me somewhat last year. And we talked about how especially ASP.NET Web API developers can boost their um, yeah, the development journey. So today it's going to be an evolution in this. It's a new feature that we are introducing um, connected to Visual Studio. So I'm super excited to talk about this. But before we're going to jump into the demo, we do want to make sure, because I know not a lot of folks have heard of the Microsoft Power Platform, we're actually getting these questions very often, what it even means, what it is. So kind of before jumping into the demo, we wanted to set the context here. And um, in general, whenever folks hear Microsoft Power Platform, it means the ecosystem of different tools and different services. And all of these tools and services um, provide or with the idea of low code development. I personally don't like the name low code development because me like being more like coding and like using Visual Studio and like doing pro code, how they call it. And I just want to make sure it means use this or take the opportunity for leveraging any of these tools or services to boost your development journey. Just kind of see it as a different tool within your tool set 
that's kind of how I see it and how I encourage folks to use it. It doesn't need mean that you're replacing anything. It's more about adding on to your tool set it's, um, itself. So when we talk about the ecosystem of the Microsoft Power Platform, there are different tools and services, and you can see a variety of these tools and services and lined up here. So the one we want to focus on today is called Microsoft Power Apps, which is essentially a, a local tool that helps you quickly and easily um, create a front end for your back end. And this is where, especially from an API standpoint, it becomes very interesting because something we are hearing from a lot of developers is, oh, I love building my web APIs. I love being in Visual Studio and building this out. But as soon as it comes to my front end, I have to learn a new framework. I have to um, learn new technology. So that's kind of where we want to see or how we can leverage Power Apps because it can help us in a way to quickly build a front end over our back end. And this is where we think, hey, it's like a fun thing to test and try, especially if you're super interested and super deep into your web APIs and building these out. Um, it's nice that we like there is a way to easily create a front end. One of the things, and we all know it, when a front end really becomes powerful is with data and the things you can connect to. So there is a way in the Microsoft Power Platform to bring in your own data. And this is called custom connectors. And custom connectors are basically just wrappers around a REST API that lets developers or that, that lets folks bring in their own data into the Power Platform. So we've heard about different concepts. And before that, it was like a super, super hard way to create these custom connectors. We received so much feedback about developers struggling with building these custom connectors. So what we wanted to do is because we know most likely developers are the ones building these custom connectors, which are just web APIs. We need to do this in a way where they don't have to leave their, their IDE. And this is where um, developer tools comes in. And we know there are different ways how to develop faster and like integrate the Power Platform with Azure services, but also with your IDE. So we really wanted to focus as a next step how we can make developer tools being better connected to the Power Platform. And so what we did is we went ahead and created a connected services within Visual Studio that lets you easily connect your web API to the Microsoft Power Platform. And you don't even have to worry about how, how do I have to configure this? How do I have to set it up on the Power Platform? You just have to stay in your IDE and have to configure your connected services there. And it will do all of these things automatically. And we have a fun use case with us today, which Marcel is going to demonstrate and show what and how you can actually do and configure the connected services here as well. Hey, thank you, Julia. Uh, hello, everyone. So here is the scenario that we want to address today. Okay. Uh, we imagine I am a backend developer. I do have my APIs. And I have a business need. I, at my business, I have some field officers, and they need to get access to, to this API or to the data that this API shows in the mobile. Okay. This data is in a legacy app. It does not support mobile at all. I already have an API. Why don't I go ahead and build a front end, a quick phone app, so these field officers can see the data? Uh, that's the proposal that we will address today. First step, it is you need to have a Power Platform environment, right? How can you get a Power Platform environment? So you can get, if you don't have yet, you can get what we call the developer plan. Uh, we have in our developer documentation, aka.ms slash PowerDev. We do have instructions how you can create a developer environment. It's a super simple process. You just go ahead and create and you will have three environments for free with all the capacity, okay? Here, I already have my environment, so I will go to my API. So this is my API. It basically has three operations. One, to return the items of a warehouse. Another run, another one to return the warehouses that I have. And other, that I will pass an item ID and it will return how many items are available in a given warehouse. So is the invent on hand. 
So this API is fine, is working in my machine, I am in my local environment. Uh, I want to go ahead and start to create a power app. So the way we enable it is in the connected services, as Julia mentioned. I will right click here at Microsoft Power Platform, and then I will have this screen. And here I will log with the account where I created my developer plan. And then I have to select my environment. Remember, you can have up to three. So I will select my dev environment. And then you have to select your solution. And a Power, a power App solution is basically think as a project. It's a way for you to group all your artifacts. Okay, So I already have a solution I will call inventory on hand. And then I will create the custom connector. The custom connector is what makes my API available in my environment. I will create. And I will create another thing here, which is a dev tunnel, which I will talk in a bit. So I will just here dev tunnel. OK. And then I will finish. And what uh, what Visual Studio will do for me, it will generate the Swagger file, the open API, uh, to make this, this API available in my Power Platform. And I can customize if I want. I can extend the open API. In my scenario, I will let Visual Studio do everything for me because the standard will work fine. And in most of the scenarios, the standard will work fine. Uh, in po From Power Platform point of view, this is source code, but we will get to it. Important it is the files are, are generated, and now my API is connected to Power Platform. And let's see what it means. So I will run my API. And this, it will show um, a screen that you are used to. Let me just bring it over because it will open in another screen. It is here. All right. I will click Continue. This is telling me about the dev tunnel. Here's my, uh, my swagger, OK? And here are my three operations. For my app, I will use these two operations, items and invent on hand. So let's go to it and see what it, what it means. So here from Visual Studio, I can select the service dependence, which is Power Platform, and open Power Apps from here. This will take me to the right environment and uh, with the list of the custom connectors that I have created. In my scenario, I have created one, which is Invent API Connector. My API is available in Power Platform. Remember, I mentioned solutions. So I will go to solutions, and I will find the solution, which is Invent on hand, is here. So I should see my custom connector here. There you go, Invent API Connector. And then I will create a new phone app. Let's go new and Canvas app. I will select the format phone, and I will call Invent on hand. OK, and this is the experience of Power Apps. This is what we call Power Apps Studio. This is in a bit so you can see. It's basically drag and drop. Um, first, I need to add the data, right? So I created the connector. Let's find the connector here. It's called Invent API. Here is the connector. I will click Connect. And now the data is available in my app. Now that I have the data, let's insert a visual control. And actually, let's use a template so it will make things easier. So we will add two screens, one to show all the items, right? And another one to show where the item is available. So let me add the two screens here. Let me delete this blank one. Let me update the name. This is the screen one. And this is the screen two. OK, so this is what my app looks like. Uh, let's get the data from my API. So I will call my API, Invent API Connector, and then I will call my operation. Remember, I have three operations. They are here. And for this one, I will use get items. This will, this will return the list of items that I have. Let me update the layout. I don't have any picture. Basically, here I want three fields. And here I can select the fields. So the title, it will be my item ID. Subtitle, it will be the name. And the body will be the description. That's what I want in my app. There we go. It is created. And now when I select any item, I want to go to the next screen. Let me go back a little bit so you can see better. All right. So when I come to this screen, I want to 
navigate to the screen too. So it was showing a live preview as you were updating those fields, right? Yes, that's correct. That's nice. And it's calling the API in real time. So now that I am in the screen too, hang on. Uh, there, I did a little mistake here. I will refresh the browser. It's not rendering correctly to see if make it mm -hmm. better. While you're doing that, there's the cursor flickering thing. That's actually a Chromium bug. It's they're working on getting that fixed. Yeah. yeah. And you can see it's a live demo indeed, right? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I love live demos. All right. So I'm back here. I will need to add the screens again, but that's fine. I will keep this as small so it will not uh, change anything. So let's add here quickly the two lists again. One, and the new screen. These two. Let me remove this. Let me rename. That's my screen one. I will run the app in a bit so it will be easier to see. Okay. So at the moment, I'll, yeah, let me add the data, which I have not. Again, invent thing, invent API. Let me add. All right. That should be it. And now I can call the operation again. So once again, this is the screen one and I will call the get items. All done. Let me update the layout. All right. Quick change here. So let's item ID, name, and description. And that's it. And now, again, I will call this screen two, right? I will navigate screen two. And if you are wondering what language is that that I'm using, it's called PowerFX. All right. All is done. that kind of the same general language that I use like in other power things like Power Automate or? All Power, all power uh, products, yes, is the same language and is very similar to what you use in Excel. Any advanced yeah. user in Excel will get very familiar to PowerFX. All right, so in the screen two, we will call an operation as well, but this one takes a parameter. So I will get the invent on hand, and I need to pass an item ID. So I can call my first control, which is called browse gallery one, and I will select, I will uh, choose the selected one, so the active one, and then I will get the field, which is item ID. And this will call my API, and that's the beauty of using a depth tunnel. So the API is running my local environment, okay? And I'm using a public tunnel to expose this to a public endpoint. We will create a custom connector from this public endpoint. It means that I can use Power Platform, which is in the cloud, and I can debug in real time in my local environment. So it's really my inner loop. And I can get the context here. If I need to change anything, I can change. So that's the idea. The idea is to bring to the inner loop that the developer can use Power Platform as a tool, because Power Platform is for pro devs as well. So I will remove the breakpoint and I will continue in my app, which is pretty much done. I will just update the layout. Uh, let's get two fields and then I will call the city, which is the warehouse, and I will select the numbering stock. And now that they are, let's just adjust here as well. Let me add an icon to go back to the screen one. And let me add some code here to navigate back to my screen one. And I will run my app. That's pretty much it. Here I have a list of items, item one, two, and three. And every time I click on one, I can see how, how many items are available in each warehouse. So I also have options here to see how it looks in an iPhone 8, iPhone 10, and so on. Uh, this template, it is, it is not fully responsive, but it will adapt very, very well. Uh, we do have some responsive templates as well, uh, which is really, the point here is to make really easy for someone who is not a designer or not into UIs to create an app. And this is fully functional. Um, once I'm done, I can save. 
and, uh, and, and and that's pretty much it. Let's let's just pause for a bit to remember what we have done. First, we had our API. Our API had some operations. That was a legacy application that had no phone capabilities. What I did it is I added Power Platform as a connected service to my existing API. I didn't change anything. Visual Studio generate all the open API needed for me. It made the API available in Power Platform. I created a phone app in five minutes, and I can from here deploy to my field officers, and they can use that. They can use that pretty easily. Uh, I would like to address another, and I'm coming to the end, but I want to address another very, very common uh, question that I get all the time about low code. Pro developers say, okay, but I, I, I like to see source code. How do I see source code? I don't want the environment to be the source of tool. I want to put that in a repo. That's why we have developer tools. We have a very lots of tools, and I want to show uh, my GitHub repo on that. Okay, so this API is available in my uh, in my repo. What I do, what I did here, and we do support several GitHub actions. What I do it is once I'm done in my environment, I have a GitHub action to export all the artifacts and commit the solution in a source code. And is really important. You have to use Power Platform solutions. This is your wrapper around all your artifacts. So the Swagger, the Open API, and all everything you generated, it will be within the solution. And uh, then I can run from here and I can get everything in the source code. So if I, and this is highly custom, custom, you can customize. When I run my workflow, I can specify the solution. I could make other solutions. I already run that. So I just want to show can, you how you to use the source here? code. Sorry, yes. can you go back to that action and can you click on absolutely. the Absolutely. Oh yes, as, absolutely. As a, as a GitHub action nerd, I'd love to actually see what's going on here. Uh, big time. I can show. Uh, do you want to see the okay. task or, or do you want to see the actual? Uh, this the is end? fine. This is fine. Yeah. Okay. Basically, yeah. Here I will set up the job. Basically, I will I will get uh, my source code here. Uh, this is just my. Uh, it's a standard action. This here, I'm authenticating to my Power Platform environment. I will get uh, to be sure I can connect. And important, I'm using service principles. I'm not using user or password. So we do support to factor authentication. All we can scale. Enterprises use that. Uh, once I'm done, I can authenticate. I will export the solution. So I will export the solution from the environment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then I will unpack the solution. Solution is basically a zip file with a lot of artifacts. If you're a developer, you want to see what is inside, and then we will unpack. That's what we call. And I also, I don't want to go too deep in solutions, yeah. but you can have managed and unmanaged, unmanaged solutions. Here we are exporting as unmanaged. Basically, the end users or even advanced users, they cannot change this. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of our platform as well. You can collaborate with makers, less technical people, but you can control what they do. You can kind of set a safe to fair environment so they can play, they can do the things that they want, but they will not cause any harm if you don't want to. You can yeah. heavily control what they do, right? And uh, this is basically the standard operations later on. It will right. commit the solution as well. I will commit in my source repo. Let me show what it looks like, the code of this app quickly. So here you have access to, the, to this repo, by the way. Happy to share the links. Um, here, Invent API, that's my API, right? This is my solution, the Invent on hand. And this is my Canvas app. I have the connector here as well. If I need to update to the endpoint or extend, I can. Uh, let me show the Canvas app because that's what is interesting. So here I have the source code, and here I have my screen one and my screen two. If I go to my screen one, I have all the properties of my controls. Um, I have here calling the operation. If I have more complex power effects, uh, I will be able to see. And we do have a VS Code extension as well, which helps you to edit and so on. Um, and I think. That's pretty much it. Uh, here's the connector. Just, just let me quickly show uh, what it looks, the open API definition. Here's the definition. And here it is uh, the URL, okay? So I published this already, and this is using an external uh, URL. 
uh, you could update these and have uh, different endpoints for test, dev, and production, and so on. So as you can see, this is a standard develop development. The point it is our platform can help you to uh, to do things faster. And if you if you leverage that, really you can be more productive and spend time on things that you really like. If you're into, into hard problems, just quickly address these business scenarios and then you, can, you are happy to do your uh, code. And that, that's basically what I wanted to show. Um, I will check if there is any question or any comment. Yeah, there's there's some good questions coming in. Um, well, I really like the scenario you showed because you're, you're um, and please do keep asking your questions. We'll go to those just a second. But I love the scenario you showed with an existing app and then you basically light up a phone app. Like a lot of, as a business, developer, you know, you, you could have an app and then, hey, how long would it take to build a phone app? Oh, two months, six months, whatever, you know, how about five minutes? <laughs> so, um, absolutely. Yep. So, so, and then you showed with the, um, the GitHub action, but the kind of the next steps on this, you would deploy, and then you need to switch over from pointing against, like you've been developing using dev tunnels, building against your local machine and you're running against the live application. So, Correct. Cool. Correct. All right, let me see. Well, I have started a few questions. Let's go through. Just a quick comment. You could use published profiles from Visual Studio as well. If you are using yeah. those, you can do from here as well. Uh, so we really provide any tools and you are free to create your own process. Nice, okay. Uh, let me see, I will uh, go to some questions. So first of all, does custom REST auth API authentication and authorization work with Power Apps? Uh, yes, uh, if you if you are integrated in your tenant, that will work better. If you don't, at the moment, the way it works, it is you will be able to create the open API. All the all the operations will be there, but you will need to add authentication and authorization settings within Power Apps. So in the first screen where I show the custom connector, there is a screen where you can add the authentication and authorization information. Or another option as well is to use API management, which is a mm. great use case. API management really works well in this scenario. That, I've I've seen that several times uh, when Brady, whenever I talk with Brady Gaster about his oh, use API, I'm oh, you got to use that. I'm a big fan of API API management, and yeah, I... cool. All right, let's go on to the next. Um, how do I make sure that any customer integrate Power Apps with my .NET applications? Any user connect? Uh, not sure. Um, any user connect own Dataverse to my backend app? So integrating, I guess it's integration scenarios. Yeah, I think I, I will. I will talk a little bit about it. So let me define what is Dataverse. Okay. Dataverse is a way for you to store your data within Power Platform, but it's not only a database. It provides lots of security layer and also lots of uh, schemas for you to store entities. And each environment, they have their own Dataverse. It's where you store this data. Okay. So yes, you can have these scenarios. You can use a, you can use a Dataverse as, as a data source as well. In, what we are doing here, we are just uh, enabling the API to be available in Power App. You could store that in Dataverse if you want. You could you could even integrate better using something that we call uh, virtual tables or virtual entities, where mm -hmm. you can make Power Platform understand your external data, or you can migrate as well. If you want to move your data to Dataverse, that's fine. We have several tools to help you with that. Uh, but what I would like for people to take from it, it is Power Platform Solutions. It is not data, so I cannot use Power Platform Solutions to move data, okay? It's just metadata, it's just the artifacts. If you want to move data, we have other tools like uh, CMT, as we call, Configuration Migration Tool, and we have a bunch of other options. So yes, it's possible to do these scenarios as well and mix and match and use different components. Okay. As we're talking about data, the other thing that um, I'm thinking of is a build they talked about fabric as a, as a new kind of, does that change any, or I guess it's kind of the same answer, right? It's you know. uh, Yeah, this is more on the on the data analytics part, when you okay. consume data to generate dashboards. Uh, I'm not an expert in that, I would not lie to you, but yes, we do, <laughs> we do support some scenarios. But that's very new, so I'm learning as well. Okay. 
Uh, all right, question. Uh, which version of Visual Studio supports this? Uh, currently, it is in the preview. Uh, if uh, is 17.6, the preview, it will be G8 in the 17.7. Okay. So if you want to test today, just download the Visual Studio preview. Uh, you should be able to play with it, and you should work as, exactly as you see here. There is a difference on this solution, I think. But anyway, play with it and let us know. Give feedback. We do have a few blog posts. It's really easy to find me or Julia, and we are really keen to engage with the community. So give okay. us your feedback, please. We'll make yeah, sure. Yeah, I really want to echo on that is because right now we're still in an internal preview, right? So for us moving to GA, any kind of feedback we are getting from the community or from anybody using it, we are happy to use this and incorporate the feedback into going GA or for, for what we have planned next. So yeah, definitely want to highlight I can, that. I can quickly uh, mention the email that we have for this feature is PP, mm -hmm. as in Power Platform, ppdevtools at microsoft.com. So if you okay. want to reach out, ppdevtools at microsoft.com. All right, let me see. I'm going to put it on a banner on the screen while I awkwardly look to the side. OK, so here, let's create a new banner. Let's see if I got to do mail. OK, and I should have said that to you before, John. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. OK, let's see if I got this right. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. OK, that's us. So as we go through um, questions, and then we'll pop that back up at the very end. Is there also, a, um, so email is great. Is there other ways that people should engage? You mentioned some blog posts. If you want to, while we're taking questions too, either of you can share with me in the private chat here and I'll, I'll, get, I'll make sure we get that added too. So, um, cool, all right, let's go back to some more questions. Great questions coming in. Um, so I'm not sure, is model-driven supported? I'm not sure. Uh, okay, model driven is a way for you to build applications from the data that you have in Dataverse. Um, depends on depends on what do you mean by supported, because if you are using a custom connector, you you are using an external data, right? So in that sense, in a Canvas app, you can use model driven. You can mix and match, but the ideal scenario it is to use virtual entities or virtual tables, as I said before. This is not a scenario that we are addressing now uh, from Visual Studio. There's nothing specific for that, but it's possible to do. And I will be keen to hear more about what are you thinking. So, okay. yes. All right. Let me see. Is it always necessary to register an application in Azure AD for .NET development for, with Power Tools? So I don't think you did there, did you? Did you did I, did, I did not. I had to do with GitHub Actions, yes, oh, okay. because I was using service principle. So yes, that's authentication. <laughs> there is no workaround security, right? So really depends always. Um, it it's really depends. I didn't do, let, let me point out, I didn't do anything specific for .NET. Mm. The service principle that I did, it was for GitHub Actions. The API itself, I don't need to register anything. As long as I have a reachable endpoint and I can authenticate, that should be enough. I don't need to add any extra register application, no. Okay, uh, let me see. Is there a way to validate access to the screen? So I guess, and you know, that makes me think of like, if there are certain screens you want different people to be able to access. Uh, there are ways of doing that. The ideal scenario, if you want to control what user wants to do at user level, Dataverse is the great solution for that because you can group the users by user group. You can give access to a specific fields, to a specific, uh, to a specific areas. In the Canvas, it's possible to do is a is a is a more work, uh, but um, yeah. The, the, the short answer is, is possible, but ideally you will use Dataverse for that. Okay. 
Um, in terms of maybe just to add on to that, in terms of accessing the Power App itself. So in Microsoft Power Platform, there is the concept of environments. So you can allow certain users only to ex um, access certain Power Platform environments, but you can then display a bunch of different um, Power Apps, for example, and only users able to access the environment are also allowed to see even um, the Power App itself. So that's another okay. way to user control who has who can even see the power app in, in, in the first hand. Okay, so that's segmenting out then at the app level, not at the screen On level. the app level though, yes, yeah. yes. But since the screens are so quick to put together, maybe not, you know, I'm gonna probably uh, fine to do that. Okay, um, quite a few questions about like licensing and pricing. So do you need a special license for this? So to, we, we to test this, to test and build, there is no charge. You can get a developer environment for free and start to build, and this never expires. So you can build solutions forever with no charge. What, the way we, we use licenses is, is when people consume the app. So in that sense, you have to have some license, could be per tenant or could be per user. There are different ways. I'm not specialist in license, but, but the long, the short answer, it is, we, you need license when you run the app. That's when you need license. All right. Um, for if if people want to go kind of more into that, maybe it'd be good to get a link on that, like how people can understand the licensing or, or pricing. Um, I can. I will get a link for that. Yes, there are okay. several options on it, and you can even uh, pay as you go as well. We can use. Uh, you can use pay as a go. There are several options. I will put the link to use better information. Great. Okay. Uh, question here. Can this tool be used cooperatively by a team? I'm not sure which tool they're talking about. Uh, um, if this is the Visual Studio Dev Tunnels or uh, I'm not sure, actually. For this, how I think I can talk a little bit about this. So we've actually talking to a bunch of customers, how they have used different, let's call them scenarios. So for example, we have seen the setup of, they have a team of developers building the web APIs. They have a team of more business users mm -hmm. building the application itself, because in this way, most likely the business users will know what the requirements of the front end or the design might look like. And the developer is the one in charge of data security, building the actual connection to the data. So we've seen the setup of two different teams working together and one being able or one team using Power Apps, the other one still like doing their day to day job as a developer and being within Visual Studio most of the time. And something else now, especially with Dev Tunnels, what we've seen is um, you can even build together with a different team partner and the app application at the same time because you only have to share the connection to your dev tunnels. So the user does have access, li basically live access to your local machine via the dev tunnels. And then it's a way to collaborate on it at the same time in a way as well. Um, you can share even in the maker mode and the power platform side, you can share access and multiple people editing it. Um, oh. I'm not sure myself how easy it is to edit it at the same time. But there are ways that two users, for example, can build a front end, and that is possible. Okay. Yeah, I can comment. I can comment a little bit on that. Uh, altering multiple people using the same Canvas app is something that we don't fully support. Uh, basically, one person per time is the way to go at the moment. We have some experimental features to enable this collaboration, uh, but you need to keep in mind when you are uh, doing that usually makers want to do that and when i say makers i'm referring to a less technical people who, who really uses that to address a business scenario okay as a pro developer the way to go it is to use source code as your source of truth because if you do that each developer can have a developer environment and then you just check stuff back in when you do the changes that's really the way to do if you want to add it at the same time uh, but it really depends. We have different users, depends on what you want. There are multiple, way, multiple ways of addressing this challenge. Okay. 
Uh, let me see. I think we may have already kind of covered this in as much deal, detail as we can, but um, asking about federated access, an app hosted on Azure infrastructure, accessing data in a customer environment. Is the, is the way you would, like I would think maybe to do this just by building a custom API, my API handles that access issue. That's exactly it. That's exactly okay. it. All right. Something uh, special. Question here on building um, Power Apps solutions locally using Visual Studio. So you showed that doing in the browser where you were kind of creating that. Is there any way to develop locally? Uh, as of today, no. Uh, our platform is basically uh, is in the cloud. Uh, mm -hmm. You have access to the source code. You can do some operations. So, for example, I might be too deep now. We have a we have a tool called Pack CLI, which is a command line interface. You can create an app from your API with, uh, using a verb called Pack Canvas Create. This will generate a Canvas app locally. But for you to see the app, you need to go on the cloud. So okay. this is a, this is a scenario that yes, uh, we we know we would like to support, but uh, we are far from it at the moment. I mean, in a way, it does make sense. It's like it's a cloud-based solution, right? So you're going, exactly. you know, so that does make me wonder too, for the, the power app, like the phone app itself, is it, does it handle some disconnected scenarios or occasionally? Oh, yes, we do. We do support offlining the app. We have uh, okay. to support offline use of it. Uh, there are lots of advanced stuff. This is really scratching the surface. I did a really quick app. You can really do very creative things with power apps. Is uh, is more powerful than, than people think. Okay, so I'm glad I asked about that. Then, so from a development point of view, you do need the browser, but for the, I mean, you and you do need the connection, but for like actually running the app, that can run well offline. Cool. In in your phone, yes. Okay. In your device, yes. I think that's about all the uh, the questions we did. So about the pricing, I don't know. There was um there was a. Uh, uh, you shared over the link with me, and I shared it in the chat. Let me see. I'm trying to unstart, hide the comments. Da, da, da. And then, um, so we do have the link to the pricing. I don't know if we, um, did you want to share any more on that? or? or um... Yeah, basically, the important context it is Power Platform, it will address uh, business challenges. So it helps you to build business application. So all the license is really uh, related to the tenant. You can, depends on the products that you already use. Uh, if you have M365, you might have access to a couple of things. Um, and also there, if you're using Dataverse, there is a space on Dataverse as well. So there are several options which usually it is again. It is always in the in the tenant context. So, yeah. I will, and again, I'm not a specialist, so I will not go deeper to do not say wrong things. But if you have uh -huh. advanced questions, feel free to drop an email, and I will find the right person to help you with that. Great. Okay. We are running out of questions. I think we've answered all the questions. Um, so we're if if there's anything else we want to cover, that's great. Otherwise, we can just kind of wrap up with. Uh, Oh, you, so you did share the blog post with me. Can, can we actually go over to that easily enough? It's the... Yes, um, and I also I also shared the GitHub repo if people want yeah. to look at the code. Yeah, uh, that would be Emily, great. Do you have the link of the blog post handy, Julia, by any chance? It's in the... Here, let me grab it out of the... It's this right here. Uh, wait, sorry. It is that... Uh, yep. Let me take it. But basically, in this blog post, we are showing how to create a power. Uh, maybe let me let this the author of the blog to talk about it. Do you want to talk about it, Julia? <laughs> oh, thank you, Matsa. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, what the blog post focuses on is the Visual Studio integration. So we are talking, we don't have a specific use case. Of course, we're talking about a use case here, but the main focus is on how to enable it in Microsoft, uh, in Visual Studio, how to connect there. We have a few um, videos, how to um, walk you through what you can do. It is a if I have to summarize it, it's a 
summary of what we've learned today, just a wrap up, or if you need to relook or watch a um, little bit of sequences, what Ms. Hellish just showed, this is what the blog is uh, blog post is about. Um, so yeah, we are walking through a real doing like all of the itty bitty steps that you have to do within Visual Studio and to get, get the connection flowing. Great. Okay, well, so for, for people watching with more questions and this blog post should hopefully answer your questions. I think there was a link to towards the end for like, you know, if you have more questions or, or whatever. And then we also do have the email here where people can reach out to, to the team. Uh, we're out of questions. I think you've covered everything. Any, uh, should we wrap up there? Yeah. Well, yeah, so thanks I everyone think, uh, for tuning in. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for the great demos, a great explanation. And uh, please do come back when you've got more updates. Always happy to, to see. And um, this this is also making me think more about like wow this uh, turning on building a phone app or for, you know front end for something that I'm building at work that that sounds pretty useful so I'll have to try that out. Well, I am a develop. I used to be a developer myself. I'm still consider myself a developer and back end, and this <laughs> is is bliss to me because I never was into UI stuff. So I really like this feature. Very nice. Okay. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks for for the great uh, presentation and demos. And we'll. Catch you back soon on ASP.NET Community Standup. Thank you.